Hey, happy Friday. This week we learned that Huawei was able to start making its own 5G chips again, kind of. Then we got some really surprising statistics of foldable smartphone sales and e-bike maker Avan Move kind of almost went out of business with a twist. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Okay, this week we start the brief with a new Sony camera called the A6700, which is looking a lot like a new mid-range king. Sony basically squeezed a premium sensor and the majority of their fancy camera tech into a body that is just 1,400 US dollars. Not bad. Next up, the Nothing Phone 2 launched, and with this generation, we get almost flagship specs, a slightly curved backside, a more advanced cliff, and US availability as well. The only kind of bad news is that the price is now $599, but I think that is still pretty okay given the improvements. I was also browsing through the latest quarterly market share statistics from Counterpoint this week, and what surprised me the most is that the OnePlus apparently emerged as the fastest growing top 10 smartphone brand globally in the first quarter. This is thanks to a surge of sales in India and China, and it is yet more proof that we, the tech enthusiasts, are a small echo chamber, and that what we think about the phone brand rarely has anything to do with their actual sales. Next, Google put out a big update for Bard, which can now talk in 4 new languages, including many European ones, as well as a few other improvements. That is pretty cool. Also this week, the Microsoft Activision Blizzard deal, which looked almost dead, suddenly came back to life as Microsoft won in court against the US FTC. And that then immediately led to the UK regulator saying that it would negotiate, despite earlier saying that they would definitely not let the deal through. The US FTC is still appealing, so the drama is not over yet, but this is a really big win for Microsoft. Microsoft. Fun fact, Microsoft theoretically will have to pay Activision $3 billion if the deal doesn't go through by Tuesday next week, and the FTC can block their deal until today, so everyone is in a real big hurry. Next, Google has just announced that it is enabling new blockchain-based experiences on Google Play by changing their policy to allow apps on the Play Store that allow you to buy and sell digital assets such as NFTs. I bet most people haven't even thought of NFTs in a year, so the poor grifters will have an uphill battle trying to convince us to invest into their whatever coin soon. Also this week, Elon Musk unveiled XAI, a new AI company that will um, understand the true nature of the universe and where the goal is to, quote, develop the theory of everything for large neural networks. That is a pretty big pivot from somebody that just a few weeks ago asked for everyone to please stop all of their AI developments. And apparently the whole team working on XAI consists only of men. I'm sure that's not going to have any negative consequences at all. And finally, in the brief, we heard from Ben's gadget reviews that the Honor Magic V2 foldable is going to launch globally. This is the world's thinnest and lightest foldable that is lighter than, say, an iPhone 14 Pro Max, despite even having a 5000 mAh battery, so it is a pretty exciting new device. Ben says that the device will launch globally at IFA in Berlin in early September. Okay, talking about foldables, we got some really interesting new statistics from Counterpoint about their sales, which completely took me by surprise. In the first quarter of 2023, global foldable smartphone shipments grew 64% year over year to 2.5 million units, which is especially impressive given that the overall smartphone market was shrinking heavily. And while there was growth in all major foldable markets, China completely outperformed the others with sales growing by 117%. That means sales more than doubled and China now sells more than a million foldables a quarter. So why is China such an outlier? Well, apparently it's as simple as not having just a single company that dominates the complete market, so there's actually competition. While last year Huawei was completely dominant, by 2023 Oppo and Samsung basically completely caught up with them with 27 and 26% market share respectively, and Honor, Vivo and Xiaomi all have a decent chunk of the market too. Samsung specifically made the W23 and the W23 Flip to better compete in the insanely competitive Chinese market, and of course this chart doesn't even include Motorola's latest Razer, so the competition will only get even more heated soon. So this is what real competition looks like. 
A million units sold a quarter is still considered pretty niche compared to the gigantic size of the overall Chinese smartphone market, but this is the only category that is growing on the Android side, and these are all high value flagship phones, so they're super important to phone makers. Okay, and for my second story of the week, Huawei might be getting back to making 5G phones again by building its own 5G chips, even if it is a pretty slow start for now. So Huawei phones in the last few years have been 4G only because the US specifically barred companies like TSMC from making the chips that Huawei designed themselves, while chip makers like Qualcomm were only allowed to sell Huawei their 4G only chips, which had their 5G capabilities disabled. But now a new report from Reuters claims that Huawei is poised to overcome the US ban with a return of 5G phones as soon as the end of this year, thanks to the company developing its own semiconductor design tools known as EDA tools and thanks to the Chinese fab SMIC. If you remember, about a year ago, we reported that SMIC has theoretically figured out how to make chips using a 7 nanometer process, and this is apparently what Huawei is going to use. The process is called SMIC N plus 1, and while a year ago we were somewhat skeptical about it, we now hear that it is good enough for Huawei to make a few million chips with it. The only problem is that a pretty abysmal yield rate of under 50% is expected. That's right, less than half of the chips that they make would actually be usable. So on the one hand, if we can believe these reports, then that means that China does indeed have its own 7 nanometer process that they can use to make chips, and they also have their own 5G chip soon, and both of those are pretty serious achievements. But on the other hand, the yield rates are pretty terrible, 7 nanometers is also about 5 years behind what the leading edge fabs can do outside of China, and of course China also doesn't have any real path beyond 7 nanometers that I'm aware of, because they don't have EUV tools which are needed for the more advanced processes, so this is a kind of limited victory. Okay, and for my third story of the week, Van Moof, the fancy e-bike maker, is apparently in trouble. It has stopped taking orders, it shut its stores, it can't pay its bills, and it entered into a type of chapter 11 bankruptcy situation in the Netherlands to try to stay afloat. Vamov has already raised almost $200 million, but they are constantly losing money, and so they will probably need to raise even more investor funding to stay alive. The company's most likely problem is that almost everything about their bikes, from the app to the components, are custom made, which means they look nice, but the process for getting all of that made is just extremely expensive. And this is of course also a problem for its users, who could be in deep trouble if the company goes under. While I like how beautiful and well-integrated bikes like the Van Moves and my cowboy are as well, this is a good time to remind people that bikes that are not made with standard components, but rather really customized ones, are a real risk. But speaking of cowboy, the company has jumped in and released an app to potentially keep the Van Moof community riding if the worst comes to pass. Their app is called Bikey, it was thrown together overnight apparently, and it helps Van Moof users generate and export their unique and encrypted Bluetooth key, which might be lost forever if Van Moof servers went down and took the app with them, which would then leave the bikes potentially locked for good. The Bikey app is only available on iOS and is coming soon to Android, and my guess is that Cowboy wants to keep customers from really freaking out about the category altogether. Cowboy, by the way, said that it had its first profitable quarter, quote, in sight over the summer, so it's not all bad news for pretty e-bikes. Now, throwing together an app like this overnight that can potentially save the bikes of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, is not just a really nice thing to do, it also really demonstrates just how completely overpowered technical skills can be. And if you'd like to be the person who has such technical skills, then there's no better place to start than over at Brilliant. Brilliant is an online platform that allows you to learn math, data science, and computer science in a way that is both incredibly effective and actually fun. Their special sauce is designing custom interactive courses to help you learn, so they take a complicated topic that they break down into smaller chunks so you can progress from beginner levels to advanced ones in little sprints, and they then make you practice everything that you've learned in each course with a practice exercise at the end. It also switches your brain from a passive mode into an actively participating mode so you retain knowledge a lot better. Brilliant has thousands of lessons covering a ton of STEM skills, and new lessons get added every month, so whichever STEM skill it is that you want to get better at, they probably have you covered. You can try Brilliant for free for 30 days at brilliant.org TFC, and the first 200 people sign up using that link will also get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So check them out, happy learning, and I'll see you next Friday.